thank, thank everybody for coming is the first thing we always like to do at, at any event. And we realize that there are lots of different things happening in the community, on campus right now. And this is part of an effort that we have to connect many of our students to the community of, uh, of Dayton. And I couldn't believe when I sent out invitations to people to participate in this, I figured, okay, I'm going to be lucky if I get three or four people who agree to do this. Much to my surprise, everybody I sent an email or a message to said would love to do this. So if it seems like the table is awfully full, it's their fault. <laughs> okay, it's scary when only one person in the crowd laughs with you. <laughs> That's a bad sign. But, but, but no, no I, I really want to personally thank all of these musicians who are taking time out of their busy lives, time away from their family, um, in some cases, time away from actual musical creation and production. Uh, I'm looking at you, Tom Gilliam, uh, yeah. who's, who's giving up time where you could be doing vocals right now. I'm getting text messages from the studio saying which tracks are done, which ones are done. <laughs> so. So, so, so these are folks who are active in creating music. And our living and learning community is all about connecting to the city of Dayton in so many ways. Uh, in November, we have a number of individuals coming who work in prison reentry, or as I like to call it, community reentry. And previously, we've had other events where we thought about things like social media. Okay, pull up, pull up your smartphones, people. Smartphones come out. So it's okay to take pictures of Instagram saying, amazing event. Our hashtag is C21LLC. So you should make people who are not here feel ashamed for not being here. Amazing introduction by Gypsum is perfectly acceptable. To, in, again, when you're the only one laughing, it's not very funny. Um, but no, no, no. In, in all seriousness, thank you guys as well. There's a lot of activities going on, and we appreciate you coming. This is a personal project for me. Um, for almost nine years, nine years in about two weeks, scarily enough, I will have been involved in doing radio again. I say again because I was involved in, in, in music and radio when I was a college student at the University of Minnesota. Yes, I know I don't have an accent anymore. Thank you very much for pointing that out. But I, I very much believe in supporting local music. If you look at the only bumper sticker on my car, it support local music. And clearly, one of the things that we try to do with the LLC at the University of Dayton is to connect students to the community in ways that resonate for them, that make sense for them. I'm about to tell you that these musicians regularly play in the city of Dayton, and we're fortunate to have them. We have rock, we have new wave, we have lo-fi, we have country, we have Americana, we have funk, we have jazz. So whatever category you might think about with music, there's a band somewhere in the city of Dayton playing it. We have a number of great venues. We, we have a number of great locations where, where you can see this music, where, where you can support musicians who don't use Pro Tools. Oh, did, I, did I say that? I did. Um, you, know, you, you can support people who, who are making music because they feel the need to communicate, not because they're trying to make a million dollars, though of course nothing wrong with any of these people up here before me making a million dollars. But, but that's what we're doing here, is connecting to the community, connecting to the city, connecting to uh, styles of music, bands, performers that you may not be connected to. So we're going to be very informal tonight. All of these musicians are, are going to talk about what they do, talk about the kind of music they make. The most intriguing part of this is probably going to be our questions and answers. So I expect everybody here to be generating right now really good questions, right? And so, so we're going to take a little bit of time and think about music tonight. And think about music specifically that's made in and around the city of Dayton. Okay, so, so who would like to go first? Is there any kind of order that you guys prefer? Got it. Well, okay, well Liz happens to be right by me right now. What a bad choice on your part. I, I said that as I sat down. Okay, and, and, and look, at, look at how right you are about that. Here, here's a little, little snippet of Liz and her sisters in good English. Oh, this is from the CD release? Yeah, it's 
I'm stopping it right before the payoff. <laughs> um, so, 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 Liz, um, introduce yourself and then we'll just go uh, in some kind of order. So, Liz? Okay. okay. You, can, you can sit I'll or sit. the microphone is on. Uh, you can sit or you can. You can sit. Okay. Hi, guys. Um, my name is Liz Rasmussen. Uh, I'm in the band Good English with my two sisters. Um, we've been a band for about five years now. We're from Dayton. Um, we're sort I guess we don't really have a genre. We tell people we're like kind of having a genre identity crisis because it changes from folky to rock to more indie to anything. I don't really know. But uh, I guess overall we're just sort of like indie rock. Um, is that a good introduction? No, that's good a enough? very good introduction. Good that's okay. a very good introduction. How, how would you describe the influence of the city of Dayton on the music that you and your sisters make? Um, well, Dane's interesting because of its size. I think the networks that we're able to make here um, have really helped. We've met so many musicians. I've met lots of these guys, but there's so many others that we've worked with, we've played with, and so you really create um, a sense of a music community. I know UD loves the community word. I also go to UD. Um, and so there really is a great community here for music and for musicians to network with one another and work with them, one another. Um, that's we're, good. That's okay. very good. good. Who would like to go next? We're all musicians and we don't mind getting up on stage and play, <laughs> but talking talk kind of sucks. <laughs> we don't, you know, we could just follow the pattern here, Todd. Let's see, let's see. So, so uh, I, I think I pulled up the video. Uh, let's see here. Oh, yeah, here we go. What do you think? Smoke your homework? Oh, sure. Are you okay with that? Oh, he gets a studio <laughs> Shrug, which performs uh, the songs that I write, 
play guitar and sing for that band. We're going to be celebrating our 20th anniversary next year. We've been at it for 19 years. Currently, I'm also uh, I'm also playing bass in this band, the Motel Beds. Um, and uh, in between those, I've been in probably two dozen or so bands, and projects. Uh, I've done some session work for some, some friends of mine in town too. Um, and uh, here I am. How, how would you say Dayton or the community has affected the music that you make? Well, I've, I've, I've been lucky enough to, to play with a lot of very, very talented people in town here. Um, there's a Midwestern thing, you know, you were talking about the Midwestern aspect. It's, I remember when, uh, when Seattle was the big thing, I was reading articles and, and, and the musicians in Seattle uh, were talking about their theories as to why it was such a fertile music scene, which I think Dayton is too. They said, well, it rains all the time. You can't go out and do anything. So you stay in your basement in your garage and form a band. The Midwest, it's, Dayton is a really nice town. I love it very much. But there's not a whole lot to do. So you make your own fun. And uh, I've been making my own fun with, with my buddies for a really long time. Now. And, uh, and it's kind of a weird filter. You know, the Midwest also kind of, there's a cultural lag. Uh, from the coasts, things show up here eventually, but it takes a while. And when they do show up, they're a little bit bastardized. And a little bit of Midwestern eccentricity kind of infuses the stuff we do. Um, I actually, in a semi-panic last night as to what I was going to talk about, I wrote down something that uh, a friend of mine, Angel Haney Gillette, she's a Daytonian, but she lives in Los Angeles now, but a long time ago I was doing an album, and she uh, was kind enough to write some liner notes. So to, pad, so to pad my time out, I'm going to read this. <clears throat> she says that there is an essential lesson to be learned from growing to manhood amidst miles of cornfields, growing, dying, and lying fallow year after year. The lesson is thus. Desolation can be beautiful. For all that the twin coasts of America hold fast to the reputation for depth and strangeness, they really have no idea. There is too much going on there to distract people from each other. To really have an insight into human nature and the cold and wonderful realities of our relationships, you have to come here and sit and listen. Listen to the different sounds and voices of the neighbors, the days, the seasons. Listen to our own expectations of one another, where we are bound to be disappointed. Life in the Midwest is trial by far or fire for artists. Like a plant that's tied back or pruned to the very trunk, if you can survive and create here, you will be that much stronger for it. And that's kind of, that's, that sort of sums up how I feel about being a being a musician in this part of the world. Um, there's an honesty. Um, people do it because they want to. Very little chance of any money being made, so it's kind of a compulsion. So that's kind of that's kind of where I am about that. Very good. Thank you, Tom. <coughs> Michael, we, we we have to show a bit of of a snippet here. Um, wait, if I can find. There we go. There we go. Um, who ha who has played a, a house show? And one one of the things that we see among musicians, um, not just in the Midwest, but I, but I think across the country, is you play in venues that are supportive. And when there's not a supportive venue in town, you create the venue, right? So it arises organically out of the support, of the, the the interested fans or other individuals who want to see these performances, who want to experience this music. Um, the, the little snippet I'm going to show you of some of the music that, that Michael has made under a couple of different pseudonyms or, or different labels, M. Ross Perkins, Goodbye, Oscar Caulfield Orchestra. Um, I'm probably forgetting a whole host of things, but, but uh, you get a sense of that here. There's an intimacy, I think, that is, that is not just unique to the Midwest, but I think is unique to Dayton. Thank you. 
you have a question for me? Or are we gonna... I do. Okay, let's um, Tell us about what it's like to be a musician here in this area. Um, well, in my experience with Dayton, um, I find that audiences, whether receptive or not, really matter less than the people that you end up creating music with. Um, everyone that I've had the pleasure of playing with has been, um, I guess, more important when it comes to the performance or, or what we're doing than, than the people listening, if that makes any sense. Um, but it's, it's been a good experience uh, for the most part. I, I wrote you know, a lengthy thing to say here, but we can forego that in favor of uh, a more casual conversation if you'd like. But we, whenever you prefer. Um, well, it, the city of Dayton is, uh, is small, and that's sort of a fact. Um, but in that size, there lies this sort of hidden benefit, which is to say that in the city of Dayton, you can show people something that they may have never seen before, whereas um, in a city like, say, Chicago or, or Los Angeles or Portland or someplace like that, you, these people in those cities can, can walk out their door and see anything at any, at any given moment. And they can, they've seen it all. Um, whereas here, um, you can turn heads, and uh, I think that's some, there's something to be said for that. Has there been any direct influence from the city in terms of incorporating it into a song or into an album, into the music you make? Um, well, it, surprisingly, I, I, no. <laughs> um, because I think that for me at least, I, the goal of, of my music is kind of to maybe transcend the city of Dayton um, in a way. I, I appreciate the city of Dayton a lot. Um, but I guess I'm more interested in, in writing music that sounds like it came from someplace else. And is, is that easy to accomplish? Um, I, I don't know. I, to me it just seems kind of natural. Um, I mean, I don't know if, if I've even succeeded in making music that sounds like it came from someplace else. I mean, to somebody else it might very much sound like it came from Dayton, but um, yeah, I, I guess you can probably hear, like even in, in that song, you know, there, there are lines in that song that, uh, that reference things I saw on Wayne Avenue, you know, and things that, that don't really make any sense unless, you, I guess, you have that context, but so yeah, I, I guess it has found its way into, into what I write. Very good. Tom. Eventually, uh, I guess I could start closing a few of these. That might, that might help. Oh, I must have accidentally closed one. Bear with me one second. Technology is great when it works, but it also depends upon the user.
Rebel said, uh, I'm originally from Dayton. Uh, you know, we uh, started in late 2005 as more of a three-piece uh, rockabilly jazz uh, Elvis thing. And you know, we, uh, I think it's always been about us, you know, just as friends playing together. Uh, my bandmate Gavin is on the bass. Uh, we played in bands in Dayton since 97. Um, and, you know, we, uh, when we actually uh, came up, uh, my brother and I uh, were three and a half years apart. He's younger than me. Uh, we used to go to the night out uh, before it was Blind Bob's. And uh, not so much now, I mean, I don't notice it anymore, but there was a big blues scene at Dayton. And we would sneak into the blues jams at the night out, underage, get to play. Um, there was one time a uh, bass player from the Ohio Players came in there and played when we were there. And uh, you know, we did, uh, you know, drink underage, that kind of thing a little bit. We kind of got away with that. But, uh, but the blues thing, uh, I mean, that's basically what I, what I started doing all the time. You know, I want to be a blues guitar player. But then as much as I love it, I got bored of it. Um, started branching out influence-wise, you know, do more of a, a surf rock thing. Um, you know, got into the Beatles, Beach Boys, stuff like that. I mean, I don't really listen to a lot of new bands, but, um, you know, when we, uh, in 2005 when we started, you know, we just decided we wanted to expand it. So, you know, we had a friend that played keyboards a little bit, and uh, you know, we had him join, and then we had a friend that played trumpet, Ronald being our drummer. He only played a little bit of uh, percussion in uh, junior high. And our keyboard player actually plays uh, trombone also. So we have a, kind of a mini horn section. Um, I, I would explain the sound for us to be, I, th I think kind of like a hybrid of the Ramones, the Stray Cats, you know, for the, the rockabilly influence, the Beatles, uh, a little bit of Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers, since we have, uh, you know, we have the Hammond B3 organ and the piano sound going. Um, but, I mean, for, for us, I mean, I don't think we really, we just like doing what we do. I mean, we don't really try to, to be a certain thing. I mean, it's, uh, I'd, I'd say it's more just blending all our influences together, because everybody in the band is completely different from what, you know, with what they like. I mean, our drummer, I mean, he couldn't even tell you, like, who any famous drummers are. I mean, he couldn't tell you who Tommy Lee is, really. Um, but. I mean, he likes, uh, he listens to Jay-Z. Um, but I mean, that, 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 that's what's funny about it. I mean, we just, and, and then Gavin and I, I mean, we've been playing together for a, a really long time. So I mean, we basically, you know, just do our best to keep the band going. It's hard, family, uh, kids, schedules. But I mean, what I'm getting at is, you know, it, it's it's not about the money, like you know, a, lot, a lot of us have been saying, but we just, we just love to play. Um, and in Dayton, I mean, it's it's good in a lot of ways. I mean, there's many uh, many bars here that have original music. I mean, feature instead of just being a side note. You have Blind Bob's, you have uh, Oregon Express, you have South Park Tavern and Canal Street Tavern. And I mean, we've had good relationships with, with most of those places for years. Um, and, that, and that's the thing, I mean, you go to Cincinnati and Columbus and places like that, and it's mostly mostly cover bands. Um, and, the, you know, the original bands that are there, they don't really have that many places to play. Um, that's why I've noticed it's kind of hard to, to get out of town a lot, because it's really hard to find a situation. So, I mean, playing in Dayton, we, we actually love it because we can do exactly what we want to do and play in front of people here, and can't do that in a lot of other places. So. Did you see any direct influence? I know you were starting to to address some of that. And what is it? One of the taglines for your band, um, Dayton, Ohio band that plays in Dayton, Ohio, or something. That that stays in Dayton, Ohio. That stays in Dayton, well, Ohio. Well, a lot of that's because uh, of our schedules and, and like I said, the, the family thing. It's like we're, I wouldn't say, tied down, but we have you know responsibilities to, you know, stay with our families. Obviously, everybody. We're all married, and, you know. Everybody's got kids. Uh, you know, with age ranges from a, a baby up until uh, I'd say like eight or nine years old. 
but you know, regardless of all that, I mean, I know it's, it doesn't sound cool or anything. I mean, we still, it's, it's still something we love to do. I mean, a lot of people get together and have you know, different activities they do, you know, to just kind of be with their friends and get, and get away from other things. This is what we do, you know, we, you know, we drink beer and play rock and roll, so and that's, that's pretty much our hobby, so. Okay. Um, thank, thank you, Tom. Um, you got any more questions? questions or? Oh, no, no, that's, that's, <laughs> that's good. That, you, you, covered, uh, you covered it very well, my friend. Um, do you have a video? We don't. Okay, okay. And I couldn't find anybody who had surreptitiously taken any video. But we do have music. And I do have to make an adjustment because this is going to be loud. that if any of you want to get up and dance uh, in, in, in uh, 20 plus years of teaching um, we're just going to say 20 plus and leave the actual number alone I have regularly taught a popular culture class that focuses on music and twice someone has gotten up to dance so you know it, it's just a shame the fear we have of dancing is really a scourge that we have to find a way to cure in our cult. Okay, I'm kidding. Yeah. Because <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it's certainly not going to be me, people, but okay. Uh, Tiffany. My name is Tiffany. I am the singer for Dear Fawn. And the community of Dayton has definitely been a big support for our band. Um, it goes beyond just being a band. It takes a lot of other things to put on a good show. There's the venue, which we have a lot of really great venues here. Um, Jimmy's Water 11 will let you play a show for free. Like, you can have people show up for free, there's no cover. So it's really good at drawing people who wouldn't normally go out to shows because they're broke <laughs> and they can hear you that way. Um, we also have a lot of really good local artists who will, and graphic designers who can make posters for you to help promote your show. Um, we have the local radio stations, which luckily Art has been very awesome in playing us on his show, as well as Why So, we were able to go in and play a live set and do an interview about our album um, through that station. Um, there's also the newspapers who are very helpful in helping you promote your album when it does come out. Um, Dayton Daily, Dayton City Paper, there's also blogs that are local, like uh, the Fire Note is a great blog that does a lot of promoting for local bands. And then there's the other bands themselves who are more than supportive. I think we all know what it's like to play shows, so we can call each other up and be like, hey, we need someone to play this night. Can you play with us? Um, so really, everybody's so supportive in Dayton so far, that I've met so far. <laughs> but, um, it really is a community thing to put on an actual show, opposed to just making music. And Dane fans are so loyal that a lot of times when touring bands come in, no matter how well known they are, they won't come out. They will pay money to see local bands over paying money to see a touring band, no matter how good they are, just because they're so supportive of local music. Short, but boy, you really addressed the question. <laughs> um, 
Is, is there any way that you see this area community directly working its way, similar to what I asked Michael, um, directly working its way into your music, whether symbolically or in um, any other way? A lot of my lyrics are about personal experiences with my city, people I've met, um, stories other people have told me about living in the city. So it does find its way into the music. Do you, do you find that you purposefully do that, or does it just kind of happen? I am not good at making up stories. I have to write from personal experience, so it does help. <laughs> Thank you, Tiffany. Burris. Now, now I'm, I'm going to show a clip of me and but with several of these uh, musicians. You'll see they're involved in multiple projects. Um, here, here is a, a clip from Me and Mountains. <laughs> <laughs> oh, YouTube, you evil, evil beast. Uh, okay, well, we'll just take that as a sign. Uh, sorry that, 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 that it stopped on, on the Spurs. That was um, a really awkward show. That was, uh, <laughs> so you're, you're comfortable with that yeah, pause. I recognize that video. That was Northside Tavern in Cincinnati, actually. Oh, gosh. Well, we're just we're just demonstrating the music, if not always the, the, the particular um, a particular venue here. I mean, because I saw Foxy Friends, which uh, Mrs. Dr. J had to, had to leave a little early, um, which, which she's like, make sure you play Foxy Friends. And I saw she wasn't here. So I realized I didn't have to. Um, <laughs> You'll hear about it. Yeah, probably, actually. Um, but but uh, uh, if, if you ever do listen to our radio show, uh, Burris has actually emailed and, and texted us or, or sent a message through Facebook we have other songs that you might yeah. consider playing. And that's, I always point out, it's her favorite song. That's, <laughs> that's, our, that's our first song we ever wrote. So I'm really sick of hearing it. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, Burris, would you introduce yourself? Uh, I'm uh, Burris Dixon. I'm originally from uh, Beaver Creek and Xenia. And uh, I grew up on a farm. Uh, southeast of Xenia in a place called Caesar Creek Township. Um, I didn't really move or experience much of Dayton until I was an adult. I moved to the South Park area. Uh, so I was pretty close to the campus. Um, and it was very strange for me because, you know, I had to, I was used to driving 40, 45 minutes to go do something fun um, other than, you know, go out back and go fishing or something. That's usually what I did for fun. And so when I started living downtown, uh, being able to walk across the street to uh, Jimmy's Cornerstone or, you know, just walk outside for five, ten minutes and get some food was super bizarre to me. And uh, um, that band, I believe it was 2007, 2006, and um, it was just some guys I knew from college. And uh, I joined just as a bass player. Uh, they already had the band together. They had about six or seven songs, and uh, nobody wanted to sing. Nobody wanted to write any songs that had any lyrics, which was fine. But all of our songs were about seven or eight minutes long. They were kind of bizarre because they weren't your typical kind of instrumental band. They were rock songs, but they were just long, kind of boring. And we did that for about a year or so. And then I brought Foxy Friends. Right. And right. Which I didn't even really, you know, I was pretty, um, pretty shy. I didn't have a lot of confidence in my songwriting abilities and stuff. But um, they tried it and they liked it, so they said, "You got to write the songs," and it kind of worked, I guess. And it's still kind of weird having to be kind of in charge of making sure we have new material, but 
but yeah, it's fun. And now I play bass, which is super weird, because, I mean, I was a drummer for, you know, most of the high school, college. Um, I play guitar and piano, but nobody ever really seems to need a guitar player in bands. I don't know why that is, <laughs> but it seems like everybody plays guitar, um, yeah. so that's why I got stuck behind a drum set. Um, and that was the first rock band, really, I was ever in. I played a lot of punk, played a lot of um, very aggressive, um, kind of painful to listen to kind of music. And it's very painful for me to listen to it. It wasn't very good, but it was, uh, but it was loud and it was fun. And so this was a big change for me. Yeah. Before I ask you about Dayton, I feel like we've been talking about Foxy Friends. So, it only seems right that I demonstrate what we're talking about here. Yes, you do believe. in Dayton, you wrote a song, right? or, or was it you and, 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 and your wife wrote the song Dayton, yeah. Ohio? Well, but, I, can't, I can't remember in. if we wrote it Sorry together. Sorry about that. <laughs> Did you guys write that together? I I can't really remember. Usually what happens is, is I'll record demos on my now defunct computer, which I don't know what's wrong with it, but I would come home after work and uh, open up the, those files and there would be extra vocal tracks on them. She'd be like, oh yeah, I recorded stuff. And she would do that all the time. And uh, when we went to record that um, at Rogers, it wasn't supposed to be on the album. And uh, so I just played it acoustic. And uh, Maria ended up singing on that in another song. So yeah. So, so was, it, was that purposeful, to, to, to have a song about Dayton? Um, that song, kind of, yeah. Um, that was when I first moved to Dayton, I wrote that. And it's not, I wouldn't say it's a, if you've never been to Dayton, I wouldn't listen to that song. Um, it's not, I mean, it's not real depressing, but it doesn't really make Dayton seem all that exciting. Um, I was, I wrote say it. what? Yeah. Well, well, the apartment I was living in, I kept waking up at like 1 a.m., 2 a.m., and there would either be somebody knocking on my door, asking for somebody that didn't live there, or <laughs> shouting. I had this little like alleyway, and uh, there would always be people shouting down there and fighting. And uh, I just got kind of sick of it, because like I said, I, I grew up in the middle of nowhere. So it was kind of weird for me, and uh, so I wrote that song. I mean, it's fun. It's a fun sounding song, I guess, but the lyrics are a bit depressing. I don't feel that way about Dayton anymore. I think I've got over the urban shock. <laughs> You know? well, well, I'm, I'm glad we don't have to do an intervention or anything for, yeah. for you. Um, but, but, but that's interesting. I mean, um, so, so, so whether you, you say, okay, well, I happen to live here, you know, like, like Michael and, and Liz and, and maybe, maybe to, a, to a lesser extent, Todd, are thinking about, okay, well, this is where I'm at, but this is not necessarily a huge influence. I'm not making Dayton, Ohio music. Whereas, whereas you've got, um, you know, a particular song where you wrote about a moment of, of your life and then, and then Maria uh, contributed to that. You know, or, or, or like with the Rebel set and, and Deer Fawn, where you guys 
seem to be much more reflective of some kind of purposeful connection to the city. Yeah, I mean, is that fair? I mean, and if I'm if I'm stretching it for anybody, and don't worry, Angie, you're still in the queue, my friend. But <laughs> but, but, but is, is that fair for, for everybody here? I've referenced park neighborhoods in, in some of my songs. And, oh yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it's I don't know. Just sort of whatever comes out. Uh, yeah, there, there's no real rhyme or reason. Sure. Sometimes I don't even know what the songs are. I've had people come up to me and just and give me complete synopsis of my song that I didn't know about anything, and it makes a lot of sense. So, so, so you just say yes. <laughs> exactly. Liz, you're going to say something? Oh, well, that's pretty much the story of all of my songs, but actually, we just started writing, um, we just released um, our first full length album. We've already started writing more songs, and I decided it's finally time to write a song about Dayton. Oh, really? Yeah, right. so that's sort of where I am. In that sense, and so I'm. I've started writing some lyrics, and we have the instrumentation down. But it's like I need to write about this place. It's obviously had a huge impact on me, and I love it. So it's finally time for the Dayton song. And Tommy, you look like you were going to say something. Yeah, I mean, uh, I've uh, on on the lyric front. I mean, when it when it comes to songs being about Dayton, I mean, I've got an easy job. I'm I am not the lyricist at all, but I do have a lot of input as to you know what we're going to write about um, our our basis cabin. Uh, you know, writes the majority of the lyrics, um, but I can say out of you know all of our albums, we're working on a third one right now. Um, actually, some of us are in the studio right now, and um, the I would say half of our songs have references to Dayton, but you wouldn't even know it unless we told you. I have to do with uh, things that have happened in Dayton, or just uh, metaphors for something like our. Our first album, Ghost Town Silence, was released uh, pretty much right on the brink of the economic collapse. And the, the imagery in that, um, that, that basically refers to Dayton and a lot of uh, Midwest towns in the Rust Belt. And, you know, we kind of actually, we titled it subconsciously like that. Um, a lot of it had to do with the album cover that we were presented. Um, but, um, you know, but we do. Uh, it was a, it was actually a lyric in, in one of our songs. There was uh, actually we wrote, we wrote the song in 2006. It was a it was a song called 130 uh, about the, uh, the death of James Dean. Uh, 130 was the number of his uh, his Porsche, his racing car, and um, you know that was one of the lyrics in the song then. But that was off of our first demo in 2006, and then we wound up putting those songs. You know, making that decision to put those songs in the first album. So that just became one of the titles that was being thrown around. And like I said, we just, I mean, we didn't think about it at the time, but it was timing, um, you know, timing that economic collapse. And uh, that, that just seems like that's the whole imagery when you look at the album cover, too. Michael, um, y you're not expressly writing about Dayton. You're, it sounds like you're writing about more universal themes. And I was, I, I, as, as you hear the other musicians talk, do, 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 you, do you think that, that inadvertently or accidentally or by happenstance there's, there's, there's influence there? I, I think you kind of alluded to that. Would, would, would you agree with that statement that, that, that there's influence there even if you're trying to avoid writing, say, like whatever a Dayton, Ohio song would be? Um, I think to a certain degree, um, yes, only because a person's environment would affect either consciously or subconsciously anything that they're doing regardless of, you know, if it's creative or if it's artistic or whatever. I mean, your your environment shows through what you do. And um, so perhaps, um, but I think generally when I, when I write, I guess I'm, I'm sort of trying to transplant either myself or whoever's um, listening to it into a, sort of surreal environment. I, I like to write songs about strange themes and things that maybe um, drugs. Um, I like LSD a lot. Uh, not anymore, of course. Do that. Um, you can write about LSD. Certainly, <laughs> yes. Um, but no, I, you know, themes that are, that are, are developed through um, maybe experiences that sort of 
transcend the, the experience of this locality or this, this little community that you live in. And um, I guess that's, that's generally my goal. So Dayton perhaps shows through uh, on a level that's, um, that lies beneath the church. It's, it's not purposeful. Nothing. No, in, not in, in your case, you know, other experiences may vary, but in your case, it's not purposeful. Whereas Tiffany, when, when I was listening to you talk about the network, um, it, it, it almost seemed as though it's, it is more influential and purposeful. The, the, the Dayton has a profound effect on dear folk. <coughs> That's fair? Yeah, I don't think we would be very careful if it wasn't for the support we got. And, and poor Andy's going over there looking at the time saying, okay, come on. Why is the drummer always last? Oh, my God. Oh, no, 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 no. Oh, I'm sorry. We're going to get you. We're going to get you in there. Uh, what's that? He's enjoying this, all right? Well, uh, hopefully we're all enjoying this, Tom. Uh, can we have some smiles from the audience? Even? Thank you for, for that. Okay. Come on, darn it, people. This is fun. This, this no, I mean, he's enjoying the fact that, that we're stalling a Oh, I'm sorry. That's I, okay, uh, 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 yeah, what, what, what he said. Here's a band that, that Andy's part of. Although, I don't know, are, are you involved in, you're not involved in this particular song, though. Perfect. P-O-T-E-K, right? Yeah. In Grand Blind, Maybe it's Pop Tech Rex. Oh, you forgot your dot com up there. Oh, well. <laughs> I'm going to forget many things before I'm through. We did a little practice session. Still, still doesn't look right. Dot com slash Pop Tech. Okay, so, so, so what's, what's your little life? Vimeo.com. Vimeo.com. Vimeo.com slash Pop Tech. Oh, hey, you come up here and do this. <laughs> that look right? Yeah. Okay, yay. It's a, uh, it's a practice session recording of one of my results. Is that right here? Yeah. You, you see how much better those early songs would have been if, if Andy had played. Okay, I'm, yeah. I'm kidding. I'm sure Andy would have made a significant contribution. Andy, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, I'm Andy Ingram. I, um, I play in Chris N, play drums for Chris N. I also sing and play guitar in XL 4 to 7. 
Pedro and Jean Michel, Bob Tross, Richley. I'm forgetting somebody. Who am I forgetting? No, I think I got five. <laughs> yeah. So um, we were counting and, earlier. How about and, and I, uh, I, I run uh, Pop Tech Records, the uh, the record label that we're all on, that we make no money. And I say that with pride and sarcasm. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So this song is from the the new Chris Ann record that's releasing Friday. And the recordings sound much better. I mean, that was early before we went into the court, but um, but hopefully you can tell from that song like we're all we're all pretty obsessed with pop melody, like not pop and like radio single type stuff, but like the classic sense of pop, uh, like from the Beach Boys and Beatles, um, like that <coughs> sense of songwriting. Um, so we're we're not we're not a complicated label. Obviously, we don't make any money, so we're not good at it, but. We're obsessed with pop, and uh, I guess thinking about your question, like how how Dick has influenced um, our music. I don't know if it's influenced, but I can I can tell that it affects people's motives. I mean, because we don't we don't make anyone like we're doing this because we really we're obsessive, maybe um, probably, but we really like music. Todd's a great guitarist, so he he has to have an intense interest in figuring out chords and structure. Um, so, so we all have an interest that isn't um, what well, I, I guess an interest that I, I don't want to seem arrogant, but but it's true. Like an interest that it's not gonna go away, um, and, and I say that. I spent a year in uh, Seattle. I actually started the record label when I was in Seattle. And it's really interesting to be in a place where you can play one show and you get signed to Sub, sub Pop Records. Or um, you get a song on KEXP and it's playing in Seattle and simulcast in New York. The exposure is totally different and the potential is totally different too. Um, so you probably have a lot of people out there that are just playing the game, I guess, because there is a game there um, to make a career. And here, there's no career to be made. So um, I, I would say our motives are probably different than in a, in a big city, um, hopefully. Yeah, there's some people that you know are just playing music to get something out of life. I mean, there's still those people. But um, I'd say there's a lot more people that are Play music because we actually care about music, care about melody, care about our instruments, whatever. So is it fair to think about it in terms of you do this because it matters, or it matters to you, as opposed to pursuing some sense of, I don't even know what, what it would be, celebrity, stardom, um, whatever we would define as mainstream music success. You do this because it matters to you. Yeah, I can interject. Please. Uh, that I don't, never having lived anywhere but the Midwest, I'm, my, 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 um, I angle on this may be skewed a little bit, but I've always associated the Midwest with the work ethic. You, you, you get out and you farm or you do whatever you're going to do, and, and that the same thing happens with music. You, 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 you take pride in what you create and you work really hard at it. And if you if you have aspirations beyond this area, you, you really have to claw your way out of this part of the country to to, to get heard. And uh, so yeah, I, I, whether it's a Midwestern thing or not, but there's definitely a work ethic involved in, in creating good art, and, and that's kind of uh, sort of ties us into this area. Michael, I noticed you were nodding. When, when Tom was talking, so you can I always that. nod when Tom. Was <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, moving on. <laughs> I mean, I think I'm teasing you, Michael. Did you did you have anything you wanted to? Oh no, I just I completely agree. Okay. So, 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 so you so, so there's there's that that notion of work ethic, but, but then also the notion of if you if, if you want a certain level of success, Dayton is not where you stay. But it's a good place to be based. That's okay. the thing. It, it, okay. if, you, if you draw a, a five hour radius circle around Dayton, you've got Chicago, Nashville, yeah. Yeah. Cleveland, Pittsburgh, 
Toledo, Cincinnati, Columbus, Indianapolis. There's a ton of really good markets, very close, and it's very cheap to live here, so it's a good base of operations. Mm -hmm. so, okay. And then, but that's all changing with the internet. It's going to be a really interesting <coughs> decade to see what, what, who's standing and who's not at the end of this, this decade, because the internet is simultaneously making it so much easier to get your stuff heard and so much harder because there are kajillions of bands on the internet too. So you have a lot to wade through. So and nobody knows how to monetize it. So that's a very good point. Tom, you're gonna say something. I mean the the thing for us as a band is um, you know, no one's no one's gonna care on, on this planet more than the five of us in that room making the music. You know, we're responsible uh, for anything that needs to be done, we have to do it. Um, and of course, I mean, we do it. I mean, our, we don't have any career aspirations or anything. I mean, we just we do it because we love it. But you know, my, my wife doesn't care about it that much. My son doesn't. It, it's well, they, I mean, you're, you're all alone, Tom. Well, you're all alone. <laughs> they, like, they, they like it, but I mean, but basically, we're the ones that have the the vested interest in it. Right. We're the ones that are responsible for making sure it's what we want it to be. And, and that, that, that's, where it, that's where it starts and that's where it ends. And it, I mean, just like, I mean, and, I, and I, the reason I say this, I mean, we, we've had the same lineup you know, the whole time we've played. And, and, and there's a reason for that. And I mean, that's just the formula. That's how we keep going. I mean, it, it's a lot. And that's based off of being friends. I mean, that, that's what's always there for us. I mean, I know it's different. Um, you know, we're, we're definitely, you know, when we put this band together, uh, we, were, we were definitely not looking for the best musicians out there. Um, but, you know, getting together and we found a particular sound we make together, we enjoy it. And, you know, that's, we always just continue from there. And that's, that's how we get things done in the studio. That's how we... That's how we progress in, in, uh, every, every time we make an album, you know? But it's, pre it's pretty simple you know, to me. But. Is anyone have something they want to add? Uh, Andy, Tom said something that um, reminded me of the idea of creating your scene. And I, I think we have to do that here in Dayton. And uh, the first, Richley is one of the bands I play on. The first record that we, we put out, we were really happy with this. Was, we did the thing, we sent out to record labels, hoping them get signed. Um, trying to make connections. And the, the overwhelming sense, I don't know if anyone specifically said this to us, but the, the sense that we got back was basically, you have to create your own scene, otherwise no one's gonna care. Because, um, especially talking about like a business sense, someone who's making a living doing music, if they're looking for new bands, they're very rarely gonna find somebody that no one's heard of that is not proven at all, um, and take a risk on that. They're looking for people, they're, they're looking for other scenes that are sustainable. And uh, especially in this big age. Yeah. In, yeah. in, the, in the 70s, they could sign you and develop your, your sound and your career for several albums. They'd give you four or five albums to, to build an audience and, and, yeah. and build a sound and figure out what you're doing. That's it. Anymore. If you're lucky enough to get signed to a major label um, with all the the advantages and disadvantages that it involves. If you don't go platinum for your first album, there's a very, very likely chance you are out of there. You're dropped. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and, and even in fact, you now a hit single. Right. You know, if, if, yeah. if you don't have a hit single, you're you're gone. There's no sense of longevity or uh, your your point is extremely well well taken, Todd. There's no effort to develop artistry. Or, or, or at least that's my criticism of the mainstream industry. Yeah, yeah. Oh. So, so it's up to us to do that. Yeah. yeah. We're taking this and yeah. that, I think, where we're all creating our own scene. I think that there's something to be said, though, however, for um, this sort of almost capitalistic sense of competition that exists that drives innovation or creativity. And in a city like Dayton, we're, we're plagued by our positive qualities. For example, we're all very nice people around here. And um, I find that bands in Dayton are so supportive of each other, it's great, and it feels good, and it's nice to have that warm, cozy cupcake hug at the end of your show. <laughs> um, but I, uh, I think that there's, there's an inherent problem in the fact that um, in the city of Dayton, we listen to each other's records, and we say, well, this is great, great job, you know, and 
and that's that's all that there is to be said about it. Whereas I think that um, Todd sort of was touching on this with in, in an age of like the '60s or the '70s, where which is typically regarded historically as being this immense uh, you know well of creativity that was tapped, and I think that part of the reason for that was that in in those days. Bands listened to each other's records and they said, this is great, I really respect this, but I can do better than this. I, I want to do better than this, you know? And when, you know, The Who came out with an album, um, you know, the Rolling Stones heard it and said, wow, these guys are, are incredible. Well, we, yeah, we can do That's better exactly than this. That's exactly what I was thinking about Brian Wilson. It, it when, when he heard the Beatles, he's yeah. like, okay, we gotta start all over, guys. Right. And so, in the city of Dayton, we're so friendly and kind to each other, Nobody wants to, to outdo each other. So I, what I would like to hear is more musicians in Dayton saying, I'm going to make the best record in Dayton, and I want you to disagree with me. I want you to hear it, and I want you to say, no, that's not the best record in Dayton. I can make the best record in Dayton. And then I want you to do it. I want you to actually make a record that's better than mine. And so to a certain degree, when it comes to making our own scene, I think that our, our uh, our friendliness, our Midwestern attitude, kind of hurts us. So, so does, it, does it pull back innovation, you think? Yeah, I think it does. So, 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 it, so it is limiting where people could try to be more creative, whatever that might mean, or, or strive to be more creative. This, this um, one-upmanship, yeah. you know, it, it, it does, it drives that like competition. Yeah, sure. absolutely. Well, sure. we definitely try to top, I think we all try to top our, our, our previous albums. You know, you look at your first album, like, hey, you know, we can, production-wise, playing everything, we can improve on that. But I think that's probably usually about the extent of it. You just, I mean, you want to do better than you did on the last one. Yeah, but that trying to outdo yourself yeah. is one thing, whereas trying to outdo Todd Widener is another. And yeah. we can never hope to do that, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> but, you know, we can try. And if, if I'm trying to outdo Todd Widener, the ch chances are I'm going to make a much better record than if I was simply trying to outdo myself. Liz, I saw you shake your head yes. Well, I'm kind of in an interesting spot because I'm very new to the scene and I haven't been around for a long time. So, I don't know, hearing what everyone else has been talking about hasn't really applied to me yet, um, just because we just released our first record. Um, we had an EP before and then we released the first record. And so we're just sort of starting to get into the scene. So, I don't know, I'm still really optimistic <laughs> about everything. And I want to take this as far as I can. I mean, I'd love to not have have a real job one day, but um, the Dayton really has been great. It's been very supportive, and um, just as a, as a young band getting started, um, everyone has helped us so much. We've gotten pointers from so many different bands, um, and to see members from other bands come out to our shows, and for me to go to their shows and stuff, it just it creates this real sense of um, um, community, like I said before. So. It's been interesting. I think Michael's point though is very well taken though. We can still be supportive at the same time that, that, that when we go to create, right? You know, like, like, like Brian hearing um, Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club band and going to his bandmates in the Beach Boys saying, okay, the bar's been raised. Yeah. The bar's been raised and we can do better than this or we can do equal to this, you know. I, so, so I think that there's there's an issue that Liz is talking about about being supportive in terms of performance and, and, and things like that. But there's also something I think that what Michael is saying, where where we need to strive for for the most creative output or the the best work we can do, or whether you will call it call it one un, one upmanship or just the effort to improve. Yeah, I think raising the bar is. Um is obviously beneficial. I think it's interesting that in the city of Dayton, I feel like with music, um, the Daytonian attitude is sort of reflected in how, how we create and how we operate as a, a scene or whatever. Um, which is to say that I think in the city of Dayton, many of us, especially those of us who've been here our entire lives, grow very content with, uh, with our surroundings. Um, we would, of course, like to see improvement, but we say, Eh, you know, I've got it okay right now, and there's, you know, there's a Sunoco on the corner, and there's a Kroger across the street, my cost of living is low, and everything I need is kind of right here, and we're content with this. Um, whereas, I think to elevate what we're doing so that the city of Dayton isn't, um, as you pointed out, Andy, the, 
this place where you're not going to make a career here and where, you know, it may not necessarily be the best city in the Midwest uh, to, to launch a career from. It could be that um, if we had this sort of spirit of, um, of innovation that I think we sort of lack because we're all kind of just content with making a record that we like and that's okay and good records come out that way. Um, but I think if we ever want to see the city of Dayton become a place where um, other cities look to us for inspiration, um, we all kind of need to reassess why we're doing what we're doing. First, Tiffany, you, you've been quiet through, through this section of the conversation. Well, what are your thoughts on this, this notion of creative competitions? Go for it. I think it's kind of hard sometimes to be competitive in Dayton because there's so many different sounds. And it's like, I know what I write is never going to sound anything like what you're doing or what you're doing. And so it's hard to kind of do that when you might be the only band currently who's making that kind of sound. Sure. Bruce? Um, as far as competitive nature? Yeah, I mean, it, it, just um, thinking about the, the com well, whether, whether, however you want to define it. One thing that was coming to mind when Mike was talking about um, you know, saying you put a record out that's better than that record. I, I do know some people that have said these things before, but it's it, Dayton is not. They wouldn't say that to your face, and they wouldn't tell your friends. That's that's one thing we're not talking about. Is bands do? There is a little bit of competition, but it's so veiled behind everything. I mean, we're all friends, but they're still in the back of my mind. I'm like. Man, we got to we got to be better than that band. We have to be. So you you've, you all experienced that you played on a bill with someone you think okay sure. we can do better than that. Sure, yeah. And I'm sure everyone's been on a bill too and said, "Oh, we're opening for that band." <laughs> or, sure. Or sure. sometimes I've been on the bills where I've said, "I can't believe that they're opening for us. They should right. be headlining." Right. Sure. You know, so it's there's still kind of that competition, but like everyone's been saying, everybody's so nice around here. I mean, we were so afraid we wouldn't even be able to get shows because you know I'm not really from downtown so I didn't know what that was like um, and then I mean we started booking shows fairly quick we had one terrible demo track and they were like oh yeah sounds good <laughs> and then we got a show and I was like that's awesome and then we started calling Cincinnati venues and they're like do you have a record I'm like well not yet do you know any bands around here I'm like, well one or two all right well call them and see if they can get you a show and that was about as good as it could do. And we're at the point now where we can get shows, but um, Dayton's, it's so easy. So, you know, the, it's hard to feel competitive at first, but it's there, you know. I'm, I'm mindful of the time, and I want to open this up to questions from, from you folks out there, probably far more insightful than anything I might ask. Does anyone have any questions? Yes, ma'am. Um, I know earlier like, you and like, some, some of you guys were talking about um, that this isn't like a place to like, launch a career from and that like maybe it should be. Like how how do you like as an artist like feel about like um, like be, living in a city that's like a place to like launch a career versus like a place where you make music just to make music? Well it's a I mean it's a great town to just make music for the, for the hell of it. Um, absolutely. Did, did that for a long time before I had any aspirations to, to, to take it anywhere else. Um, I, I think it's very possible. I'm not sure I'm, I'm understanding the question, but it, 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 it can definitely be both here. And it's, you know, there's there's a lot of very famous bands that have gone on to come from Dayton and gone on to big things. And, uh, but the secret is, yeah, you have, you have to be willing to get out of town if you, if you want to get that expo. The world's not going to come to Dayton. Uh, to find you. So, yeah, if, I'm not sure if I answered your question. Um, I, it was, I was just wondering if it's like, if like as an artist, like starting out just like making music, like which, like if you prefer, like, um, like the whole like, oh, if I'm here, then I can like make something of myself, or like I'm here, so I can just like do my music and like do it for me. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, yeah. which one you like prefer, or like think is this like better? I've got aspirations to be on to be on town. You know, I've, I've, I've been very fortunate to, to do some traveling, and uh, and yeah, it's 
they're not all like this town for sure. Um, they're uh, I I would having having seen the music scenes that I wow there's a lot of scenes in the sense but having seen the music scenes that I've seen <laughs> uh, I would stack Dayton up with any of them and that's including New York. Um, there's there are great bands in every city, there are crappy bands in every city. I find that the bigger the city, the, the proportion stays the same. There's just more of them. Um, the ratio doesn't really change much, but um, I completely lost my train of thought. I can add to that. Um, I think, yes, I think um, creative music in Dayton is unique because, um, as opposed to a city like New York, Chicago, LA, where you might be creating the music just to get it out there and be popular at the time. Um, you might spend more time on the creative process and actually actually make more or better quality work um, because you aren't there aren't a million people to show to and to get it out there right away. Um, yeah, yeah, and so you might actually create better music or what you consider better music um, in a place like Dayton rather than a bigger city where there are um, more opportunities, I guess, kind of at your disposal. You have to work a little bit harder here. Andy, you look like you were going to say something. Yeah, yeah. If, if the question is, would we rather um, make a career in music or struggle? Like, you know, we're basically talking about you have to struggle to, to make music. Pay. And I think we'd all select the, uh, the, the rock that pays. Um, but then why are we here? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I that's a legitimate question. Yeah. Family, Family for me, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and, you know, following a career isn't worth sacrificing my family and friends. So we made the choice. Um, yeah, so I think we'd all choose to make money like music because it's much better than for an advisory board or whatever. Yeah. 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 Um, as far as like what they can be, I, I, I think our culture is so media influenced and those media centers are New York, LA, Chicago. I don't think that's going to change. But I think like we've had, you know, we had peaks in the '90s with the Breeders and GBB and Brainiac. So I, I think we can go peaks like like Chapel Hill, North Carolina. I don't know what's there besides Merge Records and a couple colleges. Um, so so there there are there are examples of, of other cities that became. Musical powerhouses. Athens, Georgia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Other, other question? Another question, please? Yeah, please. Um, what's your opinion on all those shows that have, that are like fast tracks to start, like The Boys or American Idol? Like, how it, it seems so easy for them to just go on competition and. May I? Yeah, I think I think that's true. I think that everybody here could go on for quite some time about that. Um, personally, I, I have a problem with the idea of music or any art as a wholesale manufactured product. Um, I believe that in 1969, I think that the number one record was Sugar Sugar, I think. Mm -hmm. And I believe that the reason it was the number one record in 1969, we had all this music coming out, right, was that they actually packaged a little floppy, like, plastic 45 on cereal boxes and sold it. And they counted those as units. So this is the number one record, right? And so this, this model of manufacturing and skewing the, um, the numbers or, or whatever has existed for a really long time. But now what you have is this idea um, that pretty in terms of image, like, you know, is, holds more weight or more value than, than the content of what's being created by these people. And you have a song that maybe contains 15 lines, which you know would be you know, maybe the same line repeated over and over with slight variations, and it takes 10 white men in a boardroom someplace to write this song, which then is sold to to us, and, and we purchase it. 
And this idea that music as a, uh, as a product that's, that's sold much in the same way that a box of cereal is sold, I think is, is garbage because what it does is it insults us. But you also have these, these people, these recording artists like um, Jason Beaver, um, <laughs> I've been saying it wrong. <laughs> Actually, I think I lifted that. But uh, so you have people like this who are, for all intents and purposes, recording artists, right? And I personally take exception with that. And and I've been challenged on this before um, by people who rightly um, say that I I do not have a I'm not able to claim who an artist is and, and who isn't an artist, right? Um, I guess when, from hearing all of us talk about how, how our process works and, and, and why we do what we do, um, you can understand how it would be akin to um, a person going to medical school and attaining a PhD, and, or an MD rather, um, and, and doing all of the work and the intense labor that goes into achieving that little, those two little letters at the end of their name. Right, and then imagine that you're that person, and suddenly this 16-year-old kid comes up to you, and he's got a lifeguard certification, but he decides he's going to start putting MD at the end of his name. Wouldn't that piss you off just a little bit? That's how I feel. Well, well, well. Uh, historical perspective, you know, Frank Sinatra started singing for Tommy Dorsey in the 40s, and Teeny Bop was going crazy. He was the Justin Bieber of the 40s, so that's always been around. And there's always going to be a place for that. And it tends to attract people who, for whatever reason, I personally can't understand it, but people who just view music as a background. Something to accompany them through their day. It doesn't get under their skin and in their veins like it does a lot of us here. Uh, certainly all of us and probably a lot of you guys. Uh, so there's always going to be a, a product angle for them. I just, it makes me sad, though, that people think that is the way you become a success in music. And there's no substance to it. I don't necessarily have a problem with people not writing their own songs, because there are songwriters who make a living writing songs. Whether they're good or bad is debatable. But people think now that all you have to do to become a rock star is to stand in line with 800 people in, a, in an arena on a Saturday morning and get torn down if they don't like the way you sound. And then you go, well, I guess I said, I guess I'm not going to be, you know, a professional musician and just stay at home in your room and write songs and, and find friends and get a band together and you're going to sound more interesting than them anyway. So, next, next one to the punch in the back here. Hey, it looks like you, yeah. you had a thought. <laughs> to, to me, like, American Idol X Factor, it just it seems unreal. We're talking about different subject, it's not music. Um, I have respect for Kelly Clarkson or any of those singers. To be able to nail the notes um, on that big of a stage and to nail them right all the time, that, that does take talent, but I actively disrespect anybody who doesn't try to write their own songs, at least partially. Um, and and, and they're, all, they're all performers, they're, they're not creating anything. So, yeah, I, I actively disrespect the issues. Other thoughts on? No one wants to defend American Idol. <laughs> it's funny. <laughs> but it's kind of sad, though, because, like, you watch it to laugh. Like, the, sure, best, the sure. best part of it is the beginning when all those people are coming in who sing about as well as I can and they just get made fun of. And so, you know, we sit there and we watch that and we laugh. But what are they doing, like, every time after they walk out, they're just bawling. And we're just laughing. And we're like, oh, this is hilarious. And they have to and go back to their lives. Yeah, and everybody is still show up to millions of right? people. What if, what if 1962 year of Bob Dylan walked onto one of those? She took the words right out. <laughs> yeah, very good. Well, go home. You're worthless. Oh, well, okay. I, mean, I guess I'm not going to change the course of modern music. <laughs> Stop singing through your nose. Right. <laughs> yeah. You know, Simon Cowell doesn't think Bob Dylan is a singer or whatever. No, they wouldn't last two minutes. No, I mean, no. All, the, all of my favorites who have an actual identity yeah, yeah. wouldn't, well, wouldn't make it past the first round. Yeah. It's all Van Halen to go home because he wasn't facing the crowd when he was playing. Right. You know, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. 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 
It's, it's also important to note that there, there has been some really interesting work about these shows. And you, you, have you ever watched the credits? Do shows need 20 or 30 producers? <laughs> you know what they're doing, right? They're writers. They're creating the storylines and the narratives around these individuals. I also have a couple of friends who've competed, who've been contestants, who refuse to sign the non-disclosure agreements that everybody must sign before they're allowed to sing. And guess what? These producers walk around saying, okay, there's the cute gal with blonde hair. Okay, there's the person who sings gospel. There's the country-influenced person. There's the metalhead who, we're going to mellow out over the course of the season. And they're, they're casting archetypes, yeah. right? The reason why so much of this is not discussed is because the people who can prove this can't talk about it without facing extreme legal repercussions. So I'm sorry. If you're looking to television for, for reality of music, or for that matter, I'm sorry there aren't zombies out there in Georgia running around in Rick Grimes and crew or keeping them at bay at the prison. We're, we're all okay, right? Maybe you're under 21, you can't go with Glenn Bob's or that kind of thing. What's the general feeling about local music? Now you have some faces and names, you might go check it out. But before tonight, you really care about it. What, where do you go to see music, or do you care to? Um, actually, in high school, a couple of my friends were a local band. I'm from Columbus, so there's there's not much of a scene, and yeah, it's mostly cover bands, that's actually true. <laughs> But um, there were, there's a good handful of mostly college bands from around like OSU and uh, I think it's Capital. And they have a couple uh, little bands and then there's like a scene at like Scully's, which is a bar downtown. And uh, I loved it. I, I, I didn't know about the local scene until about my junior, senior year, but it was just great. And so like that's when I heard of this. I was like, oh yeah, Dayton has a local scene. Like, it's so much better. And like lately, in Columbus, uh, a, ba a band has actually gotten really popular, 21 Pilots. I don't know if anyone's heard of them yet, and they're local. And I don't know, it's kind of cool to see like one actually one of those local bands like hits it big. And there's another, um, there's another band right now that's getting bigger. They're called The Regrets, and they're two women. They're fantastic. But it's it's really fun because you know, listening to this music, it sounds even so much different than what I've heard from Columbus. So I don't know, it's it's really cool to say like. Yeah, like, I don't know. One of my favorite bands of all time, I mean, that, that we have to be friends with um, up, up from Columbus, but they, they don't really get to play much either. They're called Go Rebecca. They played a lot in Dayton in the, the late 90s. Um, and they, they actually, we actually got them to come down to, to play with us in, in Dayton last year, but, you know, every, every time we talk to them, it's like they have, you know, they have trouble getting, you know, getting places to book because they're original. But, yeah. yeah, I mean, I, it, it surprises me though, since it's such a big city, I mean, it's yeah, well, there are a lot of places, you know. There are a lot of smaller venues, but they, I don't know, they don't take as many of them, it's sad. It's, it's a whole different thing. I'm glad Shelly brought that up, because if there's one thing I can change, I feel it. It, I, it feels to me, as a member of the music scene, that, that UD is a whole different planet. Yeah. You know, <laughs> I've played UD a few times back in the day when the pub was actually having bands. Yeah, in the basement of Kennedy, and, and it was great. And, and I know there are UD bands, but I have no idea who they are. Because <coughs> when my wife went here, and she says, "Yeah, there's plenty of UD bands. They just play parties and things." And I would, I wish there was a way that the, the, the two worlds could kind of get intertwined a little bit better. And yeah, the Oregon district might as well be Toledo. Yeah. Um, it's, you know, it's a, not everybody has a car on campus, so. And you gotta walk through some sketchy neighborhoods to get there. Well, don't scare them. We're <laughs> <laughs> not playing the sketchy neighborhoods. We're on the promise night. Maybe not your daddy's start a venue here. I wish there was a place to go. Tim doesn't have bands very much, right? It it, it floors me. Yes. How how they're they're they, we have rooms like this. We we have Art Street. You know that there's a lovely outdoor space. And there's almost no use of that space. 
And, and here, I, I don't mean to be critical of, of people who are not here, but I do mean to be critical of people who are not here. <laughs> there should be a more active engagement with the Dayton art community, whether it's music or poetry or yeah, art, art, art in the broadest there's sense. There's theater, there's, there's, yeah. there's visual art, there's dance. There's all, there, Dayton's got a lot going on, especially with the side of town. Yeah. So, Bruce, you wanted to say something? Yeah, I was, this kind of reminds me of uh, we went down to Cincinnati and uh, we bumped into a band down there, and uh, they came up quite a few times and played some shows with us. And down there, I mean, they would book, you know, Southgate House for their CUA show, which is incredible right. if you can do that as a local band. And uh, they got a hold of us and they said, you want to play University of Kentucky? We're going to do this show down there. And we said, oh, man, that's great. I can't believe, you know, you would actually ask us to do that. We drove all the way down there, and uh, we go to the student union, and there was about this many people there. And uh, we still had fun, we had a great time, good sound system, and the, the people that set it up were awesome. I mean, they gave us food, you know, anything we wanted, we just hung out, we had a good time, but um, we asked people, we're like, you know, do people come to see bands here? And they're like, well, you know, bands really don't play at the college, and people don't typically go out. I mean, this is Lexington, I believe. Right. Yeah, yeah. And uh, we walked downtown, I mean, in Dayton, as far as like a band scene and stuff, looked amazing compared to Lexington. And there's some great bands there. I mean, great bands. But like we were out, you know, on a weekend, and there was just nothing going on. You know, people were out, you know, boozing it up and stuff like that, which is fine. Sure. But you know, there wasn't any kind of music going on, and nobody at the college really seemed to care. It was really kind of strange. But you know. it, it, it seems that we lack synergy. You know, uh, it, I've I've. Um, been a judge for Battle of the Bands contests here, here at UD quite often. And I'm, I'm, I'm always amazed at, 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 at this uh, um, experience. With, with, with but a few exceptions, it's very focused inward. And, and, and I think what, what Todd and I are suggesting, and I think what, what Bruce is suggesting, we have the space, we have the natural venues, indoor and outdoor, but what we lack is enthusiasm and support and you know, taking it, you know, beyond just the fact of pulling off an event, but then pulling off a successful event. Well, can I add real quick? Please, please. I'm not trying to say that it's somebody else's fault but my own. Oh, no, 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 If someone if people don't show up to my shows, <laughs> that's because people don't want to go to my shows. That has nothing to do with the college or the kids. If they don't want to see me play, that's fine. I'm not trying to complain about that. No, I didn't see it. You know, if... You know, if that was me, like I said, I grew up in the middle of nowhere. It'd take me 40 minutes to get to Dayton. And I remember calling venues, like 16 years old, asking if I could come in. They'd all say no. And, uh, you know, when I finally turned 18, my 18th birthday, I went to Shrove at Canal Street. And it was the coolest thing I'd ever been to. You know, I thought it was amazing. And I never would have known that the, they were just some local band. Never heard of them. I think Montgomery Green opened. Okay. And, uh, and yes, sir. Well, I think part of the problem for getting people to come is we don't always know that there are all these new options out there. Sure, I'm absolutely. Cleveland and we've got a really heavy metal scene going on. And yeah. it took me years to be able to catch up with who to see and who not sure. to see. Yeah, that it's, was a very, very tiny, specific part of the city that I've grown up in. Yeah. And it took me a long time. So, no disrespect, but I haven't heard of most of your bands. Yeah, yeah. Or, yeah. Sure, sure. Well, well, we've gotten that I haven't heard of most of these bands. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but, but, but it's not for, for a certain lack of effort. Exactly. We have a student-run radio station on campus that plays all these guys. And it's not just my show. Shrug, is, uh, uh, Shrug has got two songs on heavy rotation on our station computer. There are four Rebel Set songs. There's two Goodbye songs. We have almost the entire Radio Wires album <laughs> from Good English. Uh, now, granted, you can always hear Foxy Friends from 3 to 6 on Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> we have Fox and Invite. We need to do like remixes. We really do. Yeah. Yeah. Foxy yeah. Friends 2013. We have Fox and Invite to the Sorrow. Tom Gillian has <laughs> come in and played acoustic and, and done in excess covers. And I'm like, you know, we've got posters up all over town. And I keep hearing about, well, people take them down. I'm like, why? You know, I love David. Why are you yeah. taking my posters down? So, so I think that there's 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 a whole host of issues that we have in terms of getting the word out. But I think you're absolutely right. We haven't done it well enough. But with, with technology, I mean, 
Dayton You can find out anything that's going on. Well, yes and no. Yes and no. Dayton paper. Sorry, sorry, sorry. There are favorite sons and daughters there. Actually, but it's a tool. There are sure. Tools. You want to find out what's going on? Well, but at least it's it's one tool on a Can we split the yeah, difference, Shelly? Does no, this sound like a little little, little 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 like parochial battles? Anybody else? Uh, but no, uh, there's there's state city paper. There's that is true. That, that is true. Know? You're absolutely. You get that free on every corner. The information is there. I think that people would definitely be more apt to go see shows if you could do so in your underwear in your living room. <laughs> 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 that's, 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 Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm super fancy. I mean, yeah. you've got motel beds making professional videos, or, or you know, a uh, Todd might say, well, "Well, well, let me tell you how we made that." But, but at the same time, at the same time, that looks as good as anything I saw years ago when when MTV used to play videos, and I would, you know, dare I say, at the particular institution I'm in my, right now, I would religiously. Stay up. Okay, thank you, Michael. Say the only one left. I would, I would stay up and watch 120 minutes so I could see the latest videos from bands like the Connells or REM or the Replacements or Husker Du or okay, I'm dating myself. Yeah. Danny, you should know these bands. But at the same time, and I'm, 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 I'm of that period. I'm still kind of analog. I, I, I realize mm -hmm. these days there's a lot more competing with your time. Sure, mm -hmm. sure. That's but true. you know, in my head, it's, it's still 1994, and that's all there is to do. You can go out and see bands. So I'm, I'm trying, and my wife is dragging me, kicking and screaming into the 20th century. We'll work on the 21st later. <laughs> <laughs> I'm feeling old. You're stuck in early 90s. I'm still in 1988. Yeah. Well, you know. But yeah, there's. I mean, there's a lot more pulling you, pulling you in different directions. Sure. Well, no, that's when, very when true. Where I, where I started, that was all. Go out and see bands. There's literally nothing else to do. But at the same time, I, th I think Shelley and, and, and earlier Todd and, and a couple others like Andy and, and Bruce also alluded to this. There's also more opportunity than ever before. You can go on Facebook. You can go to Bandcamp. Or you can, you know, there's more ways to find it if if you explore and try to find it. Well, I was, I'm actually thinking, and I know those are great tools, but I feel like those might be part of the reason that bands don't put up flyers. Um, yeah. You know, when I have shows, I still have my right state ID, and I'll go in there and just tell them I'm still a student, and so they'll stamp my flyers and put them up. Because if you're not a student, you can't. I'm doing it wrong. I'm doing it wrong. I was playing a show across the street, and they wanted to verify that I had registered for the court. I said, it's right across the street. It's free, and you only have to be 18 to get in. And they said, well, if you're not a student, you can't advertise it. I said, it's free. They won't even let you advertise it if you are. So, I mean, can you do that at UD? Could I come and put you know, it? You know, it's, it's the same problem. I'll, I'll be real honest with you. Can you get you me know, a fake ID? You, you give me a fake ID. <laughs> <laughs> well, 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 okay. can, we should really turn the camera off before I answer a question like that. <laughs> but, but like, I have awesome cosmic powers, Curtis, when it comes to distribution at UD. But, but more importantly, if any band, and, and, and I've said this to several people at the table, and then some of you not, you want to get a flyer at UD, you give it to me, right? I will make copies, I will get the UD stamp on it, and because it comes out of our particular office, we'll get it up around campus. But I, and I think that's, and we've done that for bands, um, and, and we'll continue to do that. Um, and at the same time, though, I, I still feel like that's only part of the way, you get, you, right? So you guys, how many posters do you guys see hanging on walls? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, so, so how do you make it stand out? So I'm there in class and telling people, please go see my friends in motel beds who are playing. Please go see my friend who's doing a house show. And yeah, Shelly won't mind if you go knocking on her door. No, no. But, but no, no, in, in all seriousness, I am regularly talking about that in my classes. And everyone just thinks I'm weird. <laughs> right? But I don't care. Because I'm going to continue to do I think it warrants mentioning, too, just to say, I mean, as, um, as a side note here, too, because I don't think... I mean, I think we're all grateful to be here, but you know, Dr. J is awesome. And oh no, 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 you guys, no! It's not about that. J, <laughs> doing it. He's awesome. He's awesome. And, 
I think See, now I'm embarrassed. Now I've I'm almost embarrassed. went through the whole program without embarrassment. Dr. Thank you, Mark. Dr. J is, is, is an incredible supporter of local music in town, and everybody here is, is fully aware of that, and many more people who are not here are also fully aware of that. So we give yeah. you a debt of gratitude. Well, but but I'm not alone. Can, I'm one of I'm many. I've finished praise got a friend yet. sitting in the audience yeah. right now who's having shows in her house. Okay, I've never had a show in my house until I have a show in my house, then we can talk. we got a weekly show in everybody's house. Oh, yeah. And I, I think, you know, yeah, you, you're, you're definitely an asset. It, this guy's an asset to all of you. And in my opinion, there, there are two people at UD that are worthy of such enormous respect. Dr. J and the statue of JFK commemorating that time that he <laughs> fell into that bucket of cement across the street. Those two figures on campus are your best friends. But well, 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 also realize there, there are other radio DJs. They're, they're online. You know, there's why so. There, there's, you know, I, I don't want to be so inwardly focused that we say, well, how awesome art is. But let's realize there are many people doing this. My good friend Juliet has been a supporter, what, six, seven years now of local music. My good friend Shelly sitting there, who I see at so many shows, and sometimes I feel like I, I'm, I'm, I, I, it's, it's bad if I interrupt her because she's got such a good groove going. Um, but, you know, th there are lots of us who support local music. What we're trying to do with an event like this is to say, how do we move this to other people? And, and I am particularly mindful of the fact, how do we move this to students, to the next generation of people who, who, who are going to go to shows or create bands or, or do whatever? <coughs> I have a question for you, though. Um, there are so many towns, they are college towns, they are known for their music. Like, in the late 70s, early 80s, Athens, Georgia, the, those the house shows were going on, B-52s, R.E.M., Love Triangle. Yeah. You've got Bloomington, you have Athens, Ohio. Those are college towns and with a strong music scene. We have Sinclair, UD, Wright State. Why aren't we that college scene? Music That's a good question. Now, where that disconnect is happening, what's your opinion? Well, my, my personal opinion, and, and take it for what it's worth, right? That and a buck fifty gets you a cup of coffee. Um, but my personal opinion is is that there there is a disconnect. That the music is become. I think Michael is dead on. Music has become a commodity. Music music has become something in the background. I mean, for me, a day without music is like a day without air. Um, so so I'm of a particular mindset. I don't want to say generation because I think there, the, the, it, it crosses generations or people make wonderful music across lots of generations. But music has become divorced from a kind of meaningful experience of it. Right? I can, I, I can think about situations where, where I went and saw a band and I came back and said, okay, that was like a religious experience. Right? <coughs> you know, I, like, like Michael Azarad's book, Our Band Could Be Your Life. Right, that, that, that there are people for whom the experience of music was life-changing. There's also that deep part of me that, that, that still believes in a couple of, of things. One, if you throw gasoline on fire fast enough, it would go up. Okay, that's a joke. But, you know, but, but two, that a good song, a meaningful song, can be more than just lyrics, or more than just melody, or more than just rhythm. And I think we from my personal opinion, we've lost that connection to music as part of human experience. You know, I'm reminded of Michael Stipe, who I, I quoted lots of musicians in my dissertation, um, who said, if you can breathe, you can sing. Now we think, okay, the people who win American Idol can sing. None of us in this room can sing. Right? On the flip side of that, however, and I think this is no, something that, that, that affects Dayton directly, is that we have, on one hand, this idea that in order to be a singer, one must uh, sound like the guy, whoever, uh, who's popular, whatever, you know, Kelly Clarkson, right? On the other end of the spectrum, you have this idea, which I think is pervasive in the city of Dayton, in the sense that we are sort of plagued by the chronically hit in the city of Dayton, where to sing well equals giving a shit, equals trying too hard, equals not rock and roll. And I think that that's sad. So you, you've got no middle ground either. Either you're not singing at all, or you're over singing. And I see like this, this in mainstream music. I don't see this in, in the local scene necessarily, but in mainstream music, there's this mentality um, on the part of the listener that says, you know, that this is what a singer sounds like, 
and this is what an anti-singer sounds like. And I think that it disenfranchises all of us who, who try to exist someplace in the middle and, and sound like individuals and sound idiosyncratic and sound like ourselves. And it, it marginalizes us to just something that's outside of the mainstream. And I, I, think, that's, I think that's sad. That's a good point. I also think that the, the connection that we're missing, Shelley, is Athens, Madison, Minneapolis, um, even Seattle. It wasn't just that, that they had college towns and places to play and, and support. Um, but those uni there was always a university that, that, that uh, there was a department that connected. In Athens, it was the art department. In, in Minneapolis, it was the music department. And, you know, and so on and so forth. There was an institutional support. WXY at one time. Well, yeah. yeah. And as someone who used to live down the street from them, I, they are sorely missed. But, but there's also there was an institutional support that I think we lack. Right. And, and please, everyone, don't see my discussion of I think that music has become divorced as part of meaningful experience from so many of us. That's not a criticism of you if you don't listen to music every day, but how do you get through your day? Um, but I, I do think that there, there is something to how we think about music now that has changed. But, and again, just my two cents. And again, you're going to need a dollar fifty more to get a cup of coffee. Well, can, can you believe that most of you guys haven't yeah. left and it's nearly <laughs> 9 o'clock? Okay, how's our boredom level? Okay, is it is it is it, is it, is it night look good yet? Um, you know, death would be preferable to, to continuing this. Uh, yeah, no, we're almost done here. We're almost done here. Is there anything that anybody would, would on the panel here would, would like to say, kind of kind of to, to, to close off their discussion, whether they're thinking about dating or thinking about the music you make or, or music in general? Are are you guys musicians? Is that why they're here? Or is this just like a, are you from all different classes? Is this Several class? different classes are represented yeah. here. Well, I didn't cool. know if they were like music majors. That would be awesome if some music majors came, but that's also part of the problem. That right. You know, and, and also connects to what, what Mike is saying too. Well, that's not how you sing. Right. That's not making music. Right. Do, any of, do you, any, you play music? Have you ever tried to play music? Yeah. Yeah. There you are. There are more hands there. Awesome. <laughs> That's, we need listeners too, that's great. Yeah. And we're, seriously, we're right over there. Mm -hmm. Right on the other side of the sketch. <laughs> Have you guys been to the Murray District? Where most of them are? Yes, no, So stay away from net peppers. Yeah. <laughs> Step one. <laughs> 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 yes, don't go there. Right? Yeah, don't go to Nets. Um, yeah. There are a lot of cool places. The south down. side of the street has the music. Yeah, stay yeah. on the <laughs> other side of the street. Stay on the side of the street with those transvestite mannequins. You know the ones. You know the ones. Uh, <laughs> and you look like you wanted to say something. I, I, I guess one thing that we, we can all control are expectations. Like in big cities, it's expected you go to a show. Not so much in in small small towns like. But we can't we can't expect that, right? Because it's it's there. There are plenty of options. We make that part of, uh, of either the music connoisseurs activities or or even to create music. Like music should be for everybody. It's very democratic, very punk rock, and it doesn't take much to create music on your own. And so if we expect that, either create music or do it. Go see music. Or both. Um, yeah, I think that's a good change. I think we're all realizing that there's not a better final comment than that. Thank you so much for coming.